This video is brought to you by Brilliant. Check out the link in the description for a free 30-day trial and 20% off an annual subscription. Rock and Roll, when executed well, is a music about excess and expression. It's a music built on indulging oneself in emotion. That means intense hedonism, euphoric bliss, raw despair, and above all else, pure unbridled rage. From protests to pyrotechnics, from motorcycles to mosh pits, Rock and its many offshoots have always celebrated that which is loud and destructive. And I think that no act better embodies this celebration of rage than the smashing of a guitar. Let's take a closer look. The history of smashing instruments dates back to long before the electric guitar was even a shadow of an idea. Hungarian pianist Franz Liszt was known to play his piano with such vigor that it would fall apart mid-performance. This dramatic performance style helped to spawn Listomania, one of the earliest examples of the kind of fan hysteria that would one day follow rock artists. More than a century later, a very different sort of pianist would take up destructive practices of his own. As rock music was exploding through the mid-50s, a pianist named Jerry Lee Lewis started to gain reputation as the wildest performer of the era. His shows roared with energy, and he played his pianos hard enough to make them creak and break. There's even legend that Lewis once set his piano on fire at a particular show. That story has proved to be little more than a tall tale, one that Lewis himself happily retold to build up his own mythology. Still, the wild antics of Jerry Lee Lewis served as a harbinger of things to come for the fledgling rock and roll movement. But playing pianos so hard they break is quite different than taking a guitar into your hands and smashing it. The nature of the piano as an instrument makes its destruction a little less dramatic than that of the guitar. It's one thing to bang on an enormous piece of wood that shakes, cracks, and vibrates. It's another thing entirely to grab an instrument by the neck, defy any right of its playing, and deliberately drive it toward the ground. There are some early examples of this kind of smashing with necked instruments. In his autobiography, country musician Charlie Leuven of the Leuven Brothers claims that his brother Ira used to smash out-of-tune mandolins. And in Jailhouse Rock, Elvis Presley's character smashes a guitar over a table out of rage at a noisy patron. While this depiction is fictional, it shows the reputation that many rock artists were getting by the late 50s. They were seen as fiery renegades with sharp tempers, ready to snap at a moment's notice, and unafraid of the laws of polite society. The guitarists of this era leaned into this reputation by borrowing their aesthetic from biker gangs and sabotaging their amps to create early distortion sounds. But the guitar smash as we know it still had yet to emerge. That wouldn't come about until 1964, when a young band called The Who were playing their regular gig at the Railway Club in London. Guitarist Pete Townsend accidentally hit his guitar against the club's low ceiling and cracked his headstock in the process. He recalled the incident in a 1968 interview with Rolling Stone. It broke and it kind of shocked me, because I wasn't ready for it to go. I didn't particularly want it to go, but it went. And I was expecting an incredible thing, it being so precious to me. I was expecting everybody to go, wow, he's broken his guitar, but nobody did anything, which made me kind of angry in a way, and determined to get this precious event noticed by the audience. I proceeded to make a big thing of breaking the guitar. I pounced all over the stage with it, and I threw bits on the stage. With that dramatic act of violence, Pete Townsend began a trend that lives on to this day. He expected the destruction to be a one-time thing, but word of Townsend's antics traveled fast in the British rock scene. He explained, It kind of grew from there. We'd go to another town and people would say, Oh yeah, we heard that you smashed a guitar. It built and built and built. Soon enough, The Who had a reputation to uphold. At the urging of manager Kit Lambert, Townsend leaned into this and started to destroy more guitars. Drummer Keith Moon joined in on the action, taking apart his drum set on stage, and in 1967, famously blowing one of his kits up with TNT after a performance on the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour. The Who's instrumental destruction was a perfect representation of what rock and roll was all about. It represented the joy and rage of a new generation, coming of age and fighting against the stodgy ways of their parents. The act of destroying the instrument became a metaphor for the destruction of old cultural norms and institutions. 
This reality was made clear in 1966, when a collection of artists held the Destruction and Art Symposium in London. Led by the experimental artist Gustav Metzger, that symposium was an exploration of the power of destruction and art. Metzger believed that pretty and beautiful art only served to further the purposes of the elite in society, painting a false picture of an ugly world. He advocated for destruction as an anti-consumerist protest, a radical statement against the engines of destruction that were ripping the planet apart all the time. While Townsend himself admitted that Metzger's message went over his younger head, it resonates with so much of what was happening in the rock counterculture of the moment. That's probably why the destruction spread beyond the who. In 1966, Shortly after the Destruction in Art Symposium, director Michelangelo Antonioni had Jeff Beck of the Yardbirds destroy a guitar in the film Blow Up. That scene was directly inspired by Townsend, though Beck was a little reticent to do it at first. A year later, Townsend would inspire further guitar destruction at the Monterey Pop Festival. Monterey Pop was the coming out moment for the hippie counterculture, a precursor to Woodstock and one of the first modern music festivals. On the Sunday evening of the festival, much of America got to meet The Who for the first time. They were greeted with a spectacle of raw passion and energy that culminated in a climactic take on My Generation. The Who played the song at breakneck pace and finished it off by annihilating their instruments on stage. Just a few hours later, the Jimi Hendrix Experience took the stage for their own major American debut. Hendrix and the Experience had been in friendly competition with The Who for some time, and Hendrix wasn't about to be upstaged. After tearing through his own wicket set, Hendrix brought out all the stops for his finale. He laid his guitar down on the stage and doused it in lighter fluid before striking a match. The image of Hendrix kneeling over his burning guitar, coaxing the flames higher and higher, has been seared into the brains of rock fans ever since. That ritualistic sacrifice of the guitar was more than just a response to Townsend's wanton destruction. It was an evolution. Where Townsend's smashing feels raw and real, Hendrix's take on the practice, like Hendrix himself, has an air of mysticism. It feels like some ancient pagan rite, a piece of witchcraft calling forth powers from beyond the veil. It was the symbolic overture to a new age. The summer of love was in full swing, and music was ready to change the world. That moment of optimism lasted a few short years, but the guitar smash had no trouble translating to the bigger, louder sounds of the 70s. In 1974, at the California Jam Festival, an angry Richie Blackmore destroyed his guitar on stage for nearly 10 minutes, getting out frustrations that he had at the festival's organizers. That freakout saw Blackmore tossing several guitars around, smashing them into amplifiers, stepping on them, and even throwing broken guitars into the crowd. It was a whole new level of destruction, one fitting for the grandiose, indulgent era of 70s rock. By now, acts influenced by Hendrix and the Who understood the symbolic power of a guitar flung over the head and were beginning to incorporate it into their show. Many of these new acts made the guitar smash something more regular and something more opulent. Kiss were a band built entirely around the spectacle of rock and roll, and their guitarist Paul Stanley understood how a guitar smash played into that. He explained in an interview with AllMusic, The idea of almost ritualistically smashing a guitar is something so cool and touches a nerve in so many people that it seemed like a great way to put a period, or to dot the I, or cross the T at the end of the show. That this is over. It's the climax. Stanley has smashed a guitar to end almost every Kiss show to this day. Of course, this kind of smashing can have its costs, because the reality is that guitars can be expensive instruments. They were so expensive, in fact, that the Who's guitar-smashing antics nearly drove them to bankruptcy by the late 60s. But some guitarists found clever ways to get around this. In the 80s, Guns N' Roses guitarist Slash bought cheap factory second guitars explicitly intended for destruction. One of these guitars has been broken and re-repaired countless times over, and still remains one of Slash's favorites to this day. But not all destruction is so planned. One of the most iconic moments in guitar destruction came on September 20th, 1979, when bouncers at a Clash show were keeping the crowd quiet. Bassist Paul Simonon was more accustomed to raucous UK punk crowds and became frustrated at the demure crowd. He decided to take this anger out on his Fender P-Bass and was caught in the act by photographer Penny Smith. The resulting photograph would become one of the most iconic in the history of rock music and the cover for London Calling. 
That perfectly timed smash photo captures all the rage of the punk rock movement in a single frame, forever putting Simonon next to Hendrix and Townsend in the Guitar Destruction Hall of Fame. Unsurprisingly, The Clash weren't the only punk rockers to trash their guitars. Wendy Williams, leader of the punk rock band Plasmatics, took guitar destruction to a whole other level in the late 70s and early 80s by taking chainsaws to her guitars. The legacy of Williams' destruction carried on into the 90s when grunge began to take over the world. The popular leader of that movement, Kurt Cobain, channeled all the destruction of his metal and punk influences and became famous for his on-stage violence. Cobain would buy cheap guitars from pawn shops specifically to destroy, allowing him to indulge himself in wild acts of instrumental violence. The most famous of these episodes came in 1992, at the end of Nirvana's performance at the Reading Festival. There, Nirvana systematically dismantled every piece of their stage, tilting over amps, throwing stage equipment at each other, and bathing in feedback until nothing was left intact. It was a loud and violent punctuation to an iconic show, and a statement that Nirvana could destroy as good as any of the great rock gods before them. 20th century, the role of rock diminished, and the guitar smash followed in its wake, though it didn't disappear completely. Many rock and metal acts will still indulge themselves in flights of destruction, whether out of spectacle or pure anger. Muse's Matt Bellamy has picked up the guitar destruction torch and destroyed a number of guitars throughout his career, and in 2021, Phoebe Bridgers destroyed her guitar on stage following her SNL set, a stunt done with a fake speaker and the blessing of guitar manufacturer Dan Electro. Nevertheless, the act drew ire from fans on social media, notably from iconic rocker David Crosby. The reaction to Bridger's destruction is a reminder of how far we've come from the days of Townsend's early fits of rage being the talk of the town. But it also shows that, even though people have been doing it for 60 years, there is still rebellion to be found in the art of the guitar smash. And yes, it might be wasteful. And yes, it might be indulgent. But come on. Just look at it and try to tell me that this, or this, or this, or even this, are not the epitome of rock and roll. If you're planning on picking up a guitar smashing habit, you might want to learn a thing or two about electrical engineering to save a few bucks along the way. The best place to do that is Brilliant.org, the hands-on learning site with thousands of lessons from all sorts of STEM topics. You can do everything from electrical engineering to data analysis to programming and AI. Brilliant is a place where you can learn by doing, with beautifully designed interactive lessons crafted by an award-winning team of teachers and researchers. If you're looking for a place to start, why not try out their course on thinking and code so you can learn or just brush up your code skills? You can check it out now free of cost by going to brilliant.org slash polyphonic. Following that link will get you 30 days free, and after that you'll get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Checking out that link also does a ton to help support my channel and to help me keep making videos. So thank you so much for your support, and thanks for watching.